people come and they say, I like it when you just call me to come up and sing. It's better. I don't have to worry about practicing it. Sing along. On the cross of Calvary, our blessed Savior died, gave his life to save the world from loss. His pain and agony for every sin to hide, shed the blood to save the old rugged cross. Was the blood as fresh as mud, the same the old rugged cross. Was his love that paid the awful cost. O souls of our sweet, come and plunge today in the blood that stained the old rugged cross. To the cross, the rugged cross, they nailed his precious hands, and to death he fully paid the cost. There is pardon in his love for everyone that stands, for the blood that stained the old rugged cross. Blood is blood, is precious blood, the stained the old rugged cross. Twas his love that paid the awful cost. O souls of artistry, come and plunge today in the blood that stained the old rugged cross. What an awful death he died to pardon you and me. All alone in agony he tossed. And the world once lost in sin, and now he holy free. By the blood that stained the old rugged cross. Was his blood and precious blood that stained the old rugged cross? It was his love that paid the awful cost. O souls of artistry, come and plunge today in the blood that stained the old rugged cross. Amen. Amen. Glory, hell. Thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. Been washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been born again. Hallelujah, I'm saved, saved, saved by wonderful day. I'm so glad that I found out. He would bring me out, show me the way, like a bird out of prison, and take an its flight, like a blind man that died, in back his eyes, like a poor wretched beggar, without fortune and fame. I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out with his saving name. Thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. Been washed in the blood of Jesus. I've been born again. Hallelujah, I'm saved, saved, saved by wonderful grace. I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out, show me the way. I'm so glad that I found out he would bring me out, show me the way.
Amen. Amen. No. Kiss me like yellow. And excuse me if I do. I'd like to sing a song for you tonight. <laughs> On the night Christ was born, just before break of morn, as the stars in the sky were fading, o'er the place where he lay fell a shadow cold and gray of a cross that would humble a king. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, He was wounded that I might live. Jesus knew when he came he would suffer in shame. He could feel every pain and sorrow. But he left paradise with his blood he paid the price. My redemption to Jesus I owe. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live from his throne. Jesus came, laid aside heaven's fame in exchange for the cross of Calvary. For my gain, suffered loss, for my sin he bore the cross. He was wounded and I was set free. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live. Dearest Lord, evermore may thy cross I adore as I follow the path to Calvary. Of thy death I partake, my ambition I forsake, all my will I surrender to thee. Help me on the chorus. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, He was wounded that I might live. Take your Bibles tonight, take your Bibles this evening and turn to the book in the Old Testament called the book of Amos. In the Old Testament, the book of Amos. Let's turn to Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. Amos Obadiah. Now, if you're at, uh, if you're in, if you're in Amos, Amos chapter eight. How many you got Amos? How many you there? You there? All right. Okay. Uh, Amos chapter eight and verse eleven. 
Behold, the days cometh, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst, but of water, no, uh, not water, uh, thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. I'm going to read that thing again. I got kind of tongue-tied there. Behold, the day cometh, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you'll bless uh, this message. I pray that it would give understanding in the heart of your people, and I pray that it would give them more light, Father, and help them in these last days to be true to your precious book. In Jesus' precious name, I pray, and for his sake, amen. Now, I want you to look at my text tonight. The Lord's talking there, and he said, the, late, the days are going to come, and he said, the days will come, and there will be a famine in the land. Now, notice he said, there's not a famine of bread. And he said, there'll be plenty of bread, plenty of bread to go from shore to shore, all kinds of bread. And it won't be a famine of water. There'll be water. You can drink it from land, from sea to sea. There won't be a famine of water. But it will be a famine of what? Underline it. But of hearing the words of the Lord. There's a famine in America today. There's a famine here. We're in the middle of a famine. You say it's bread. We got bread coming out of our ears. You say it's water. We got so much water we don't know what to do with it. I'll tell you what it is. It's a famine of this book. Is what it is. And it's American wide. It's worldwide. In fact, this is a worldwide famine. It goes from one side of this world all the way over to the other side, and it's worldwide. Worldwide famine. You say the book. Yes, the book I got in my hand. This book right here. This one. This one. And when I say this book, I want you to know what book I'm talking about. I'm talking about the King James authorized version of 1611. That's the book I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about some mouse. I'm talking about this verdict. When I refer to the word of, word of God, I'm talking about that one. I'm not talking about that other stuff. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. There's a famine in the land. Now, as I study this thing and I uh, work on this, and you study on a famine, you know what? You find that there's some things that cause a famine. A famine just didn't come. It just didn't all of a sudden, there it is. There's a cause behind it. There's a cause. There's a reason for it happening. And there's a famine in America today. What is the cause of the famine? Now, sometimes there's a, a particular cause. Uh, sometimes a war will come in a country, and a war will cause a famine to sweep through that country. You come in, you get a war in there, and a war comes, and you know what, the pro you know what happens to the price of food? It goes up price of food. You get a, a war happening in the United States, and you'll never believe what it will cost for food down at the grocery store. Wait till a war comes, brother. You know why? Because there'll be a famine. The people, the, war, the warriors that come in, they'll take all the food, and the food will stop being shipped. They'll cause a famine. Sometimes a war causes it. Sometimes no rain. Sometimes no rain. It was in the days of Elijah when Elijah stuck his hand up in the air and said, Lord! Don't let it rain for three and a half years. Lord said, okay, Elijah, you got it. No rain. Brother, when that man prayed, the rain didn't come. You know some It didn't rain for three and a half years. You know what there was? There was a famine. There was a famine. What caused it? No rain. So when the rain comes, famine comes. There's certain things that cause a famine. Uh, several times in history, locusts have come in, and locusts have come in and ate up all the crops and ate everything up, and there wasn't nothing. Sometimes locusts will cause a famine. There are several things that cause them. Uh, there are several famines. You find a famine in the book of Kings, in Second Kings chapter 6. There's a famine of, of the siege. that the siege, Besiege a city and the wars around about that city, and the city can't get, nobody in the city can get out, and nobody on the outside can get in, and there's a famine inside that city. 
<clears throat> there are several things that cause a famine. And of course, we know that sin is the cause of famine. Now, tonight I want to preach on why there's a famine in America. Why there's a famine in America. All right, point number one. There's a famine in America because... Now, I'll tell you something. This is not a new message. You know how long I preach this message? I've been preaching this message for ever since I've been preaching. 18, 19, 20... I've been preaching this message over 25 years in my message. I've been preaching it that long. You say that long? That long I've been preaching it. And you know something? I haven't changed it one iota since the time I preached it. I preached this message to uh, John R. Rice. He was sitting in one pew. And uh, Lee Robertson was sitting in the other pew. And uh, there was Herman Appleman was sitting in the other pew. And there was four little kids sitting in another pew. That's what, that was my congregation. Hyman Appleman. No, my wife was there. I take that back. She was there. My wife was there. Four kids was there. Hyman Appleman was there. Lee Robertson was there. And John R. Rice was sitting there. And I got up in the pulpit and this message God gave me. And they were sitting. Nobody else was there. I don't know how on earth that ever turned out that way. And I stuck my finger out at those three men and I said, there's a famine in the land because of you. I was a young teenager. I, I was just about 20 years old, man. I was just a young preacher, boy. I just, you know, just green as a greenhorn. <laughs> man, I hadn't preached about 10 messages in my whole life. And I said, there's a famine because of you. <laughs> I wouldn't preach. They said, well, who he's preaching to? Man, I only had them sitting there. <laughs> he wasn't, I wasn't talking to my wife. <laughs> I was talking to them. You think they got it? Amen. Do you think they got it? Yes. I wonder what they did about it. They may have got it, but I wonder what they did about it. I guess only the Lord will know. The Lord will know, brother. The Lord will know. But they got it. All right, now let's go. Because of the point number one, you need to write it down. And this is the cause of the famine in America. You know what the cause is? Point number one, because of the Bible revisers. That's the cause. That's the cause. Because of the Bible revisers. You say, how that figure? You go up to this Christian bookstore and you go in that Christian bookstore and you look at all of the different... i got to take off my glasses. No, I don't. My nose is starting to sweat, but my glasses won't stay on. <laughs> but you know something? You go in that store up there and got all these different versions on the market and use people stand in that store sometime and watch those Christians that come in there. Christians come in there and say, well, here's a new living Bible. Here's the Amplifying Bible. Here's good news for modern man. And they come through there and they'll say, well, this is a nice one. Why don't you read that one? Oh, here's a nice one. Why don't you read that one? Oh, this is neat. Look at the nice print in it. And a King James Bible, they got thousands, hundreds of Bibles on the market going down through there and selling them. You know what's wrong with America? The Bible revisers. That's how come there's a famine in America today. Thousands of people are buying them. They're pushing them and pushing them and pushing them on the Bible markets. You say what? I'm talking about the Bible revisers. I want to give you something. Here's the New King James Bible. It comes out, New King James Bible. You'll think, boy, that is it. Man, that's going to be the thing. And you open that thing up and you look in the print in it, and that print is so nice that anybody would want one of the print. I was tempted to buy one just because there was printed, the nice printed, till I got to studying the thing and find out the thing is nothing but a piece of trash. Now let me give you some verses. You got your pencil and paper? Let me give you some. All right. Uh, for instance... In Luke chapter 16, I'm going to turn to Luke chapter 16. And in Luke chapter 16, I'm going to give you where the proof's in the pudding, man. I'm going to read you from the... Lord, forgive me for reading this thing in, the, in your pulpit. I'll stand over here. <laughs> Luke chapter 16 and verse 23 says... It says... I better get a little bit further away. <laughs> it says, verse 23, And being in torment... I'm Luke chapter 23 verse... I mean Luke 16, 23. Turn to your Bibles in it. Luke 16, 23. Now, in case you think I'm lying, here it is. I'm reading it straight from uh, the horse's mouth, the proofs in the pudding, New King James Bible, so you can't say I'm lying about them. It says, And being in torment in Hades. Hades? What did it say? It said Hades. Right there, Hades. You say Hades? No. What does it say? It says Hell. Hell, you say, what difference does Hades make over hell? Look at here. When the Holy Spirit convicts a man 
to go to Hades, it'll be the first time he's ever done it. When does the Holy Spirit convict a man not to go? He convicts a man not to go to hell. There's a man sitting out in a pulpit, I mean out there in a pew, and the Holy Spirit comes along and says, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. And then this book here says, no, you're going to Hades, you're going to Hades, you're going to Hades. You know what it's doing? It's working contrary to the working of the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit tell a man he's going to hell? Absolutely. Does this book a man tells him he's going to hell? Absolutely not. That book says he's going to Hades. They ain't the same place. See how you know they're not? One's Greek and one's English. You say, how you know they're not the same place? Go out there on the job and that guy goes out there on the job and hits his hand, hits his hand. <laughs> ah, man. Ah, man. Ah. And the other guy looks at him and he gets mad and says something. Don't cry like a baby. And he looks over and says, oh, go to Hades. Does he say that? Have you ever heard him say that? Do they ever say that? They don't ever say that. Never, never in my life have I had a fellow look at a fellow and say, I'll go to Hades. What do they say? They say hell. You know why they say hell? Because the Holy Spirit uses hell. That book don't have it. That book don't have it. Let me to, let me show it to you again. In case you think I'm lying to you, uh, take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 2 and look at verse 31. Acts 2.31. Acts chapter 2 verse 31. And this is then the New King James Bible. Acts 2 verse 31 says... Uh, he forsaking the, uh, he foreseeing this spake concerning the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in Hades. What does your Bible say? That his soul was not left in hell. How many people believe that Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross of Calvary and died for my sins, took my sins to Hades? He took my sins to hell. You say, why did he take my sins to hell? That's where my sins belong. That's where my sins belong. They belong in hell. They don't belong in heaven. They belong in hell. That's why he did it. Where do you think his sins is at? The Bible says he's going to return without sin. He's going to return from heaven without sin. He had my sin on him when he died. He had my sins. Where are they at? He ain't going to have them when they come back. They're going to be in hell where they belong. Like Acts chapter 2 verse 31 says they're at. You say, you believe that? I believe they're in hell. I believe they're in hell. Uh, you say, what is it? That's the New King James Bible. I got on the front of that thing. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Well, I can't even count all the verses. There's so many of them I can't count. There's a total of 700 changes in that book from God's book. 700 of them. 700 of them. You say, what's wrong with America? There's a famine in America because of that right there. That's what's causing the famine. That's the cause. You say, what? Christians all over this country. Baptist, Methodist, Jehovah's... No, they're not Christian. <laughs> uh, Mormon? No, no, they're not Christians either. There may be a few Christians there, brother. <laughs> Episcopalian? Well, there's a few Christians there too. You say, what? All the Christians, wherever they're at. You know what it is? It's because that book there. If I could take and put a King James Bible in every church in America, you'd see America change. You'd see America change. And if I could took a King James Bible and put it in every hand of every Christian in America, you'd see a change take place. You know what's wrong? They went to a piece of trash. They've got converted over into it. You see, you believe what I'm preaching? I believe with all my heart and mind and soul. Now let's pick up the New American Standard. New American Standard. The proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding, brother. That's where it's at. That's where it is. And give you a perfect example of it. Uh, let me give you an example of it many, many times. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse 16. I'm going to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and I'm going to read you verse 16. 1 Timothy 3, 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Now read, look, look at it real careful as I read this thing, and I, Lord, forgive me, I gotta have to come down here again, at least to this bottom here. You say that thing, you think the Pope is sacred? Yeah! Now you got me, you got me just right. You say you think that's God's? I think it's God's. 
Think you belong to the Lord? I believe it belongs to the Lord. And you say, the preachers preach this from it. They're wrong. They're wrong. You say, you ever going to preach that in the book? I'd get out and stop preaching. I'd go back to welding. I'd go back to tra- driving a truck for maze printing. I'd get out of the business of preaching. It's God's business. Amen? When God calls you to preach, you got to preach God's book, not this thing here. There's a famine in the land. Now, First Timothy chapter 3, and look at verse 16. And by commandment, uh, and by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. Okay? By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh. He who was. He who. What happened to God? You say, what difference does it make? It says, God was manifest in the flesh. Who is manifest in the flesh? God was. Who is in the flesh? Jesus Christ was in the flesh. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is God. By changing the word He and taking out the word God, you've just taught that Jesus Christ was not God. That's what the Jehovah's Witness believe. They believe he's an a God, a created God. So they say, he who, they got rid of Jesus Christ being God. They didn't like the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Well, you know something? If Jesus Christ is not God, he couldn't have died for my sins and yours. If he's not God, how can he die for sin? A man can't die for sin. He can die for his own. He can die for his own sin. Right? You want to die for your own sin? Go ahead. You can die for it. You may die for it. In fact, we're all going to die for it. Romans chapter, take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And look at Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, every man is going to die for his sins eventually. Sooner or later. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. You're going to die for your sins eventually. Sooner or later you will. Every man is building. If the Lord tarries, do you know what you're going to die from? Your sin. See, if Jesus Christ was not God, he couldn't have died for mine and yours. You weren't even alive. See, Jesus Christ has got to be God. And on and on the thing goes. Thousands of The New American Standard has over 5,000 changes in the New American Standard. I mean, that thing's worse than the New King James. Over 5,000 changes. I can just go on and on and on in the number of changes that are committed in the New American Standard Bible. Just hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 36, which we was talking about this morning. I'm going to read you Acts chapter 8, verse 36. I read you Acts chapter 8, verse 36 out of the uh, Roman Catholic Bible. Now I'm going to read you Acts chapter 8, verse 36. Uh, and uh, verse 37, rather, Acts 8, 37, which is on salvation. Which is on salvation. That's what the verse is on. Verses to show you that salvation comes before baptism. Acts 8, 37. See footnote. <laughs> I just read you verse 37. See footnote. That's what it says. That's the words right there. That's what it says right there in the margin. See footnote. Now I have a New American Standard. And this New American Standard was published in... I better tell you when it's published. This one is published in 1973. Now you get a later model that comes out. Later model like new cars, you know. (laughs) And you get a later model coming out. You know what the New American will Standard to do? They'll put it in. So way back there, before a bunch of guys, uh, independent preachers like myself, got on the fact and started seeing where these guys was perverting the book and got on to them about it, they said, oh, we better put that in. So they put it in and say, look in the margin. (laughs) They say it shouldn't be there. Now let's say it says, see footnote. Let's read the footnote. The footnote says, uh, later manuscripts insert verse 37. Later manuscripts insert verse 37. What do they mean later manuscripts insert verse 37? They're saying there's a later manuscripts, the later ones, the ones that are way up here a long time after Christ, 
they stuck the verse in, but the early manuscripts took the verse out, so it should be out. And you say, what's the proof that it's in there? It's in the papyrus. It's in a papyrus manuscript. What's a papyrus manuscript? It's a manuscript that the, the pieces of paper that were written on newspaper by the apostles. It's in some of those. How come they won't accept that? They say, well, they're not complete manuscripts. No, but it's still there. Still there. So the King James uh, writers put it in. They put it in. You say they're taking it out. My friend, there's a famine in America because of these folks right here. And it's reaching in America to a plague where God's people can no longer hear the book. you got to drive 10 and 15 miles. How many of you drive 10 miles to come to this church? How many of you drive over 10 miles to come to this church? You drive over 10 miles. See there? You know, if this famine stays, you know what's going to happen? You're going to end up having to drive 15 and 20 and 25 and 30 and 40 miles to get to a man who believes the book. Because there's a famine. There's a famine. All right. Uh, I'm going to give you the new international version. That's the big one. That's the big high up the uppy one. See, that's the latest one coming on the market. What they've done down through the years is when everybody bought up a whole bunch of the RSV and they sold as many as they could sell, they come up the market with another one. And then when they sell as many of the New American Standard they can sell, they come up with another one. And the New, the, uh, new International Version, that's the latest one that all the one the big hupty dupties are, are bragging about and getting everybody to buy, getting them all to buy it. All right, the uh, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, in verse uh, 37, the New International Version, Acts chapter 8, verse 37 says, 36 and 38, no verse even there, no letterings there, no nothing. No verse, no footnote, no nothing. Just 37, 30, I mean 36 and 38, nothing there, blank. Just a pure blank. New International Version, there it is, right there. Verse completely gone. Took the verse plumb out, took the lettering out, went 36, 38. What's wrong with them? They're crooks. They're crooks. Hey man, why don't you do it like the Catholics did it? How'd the Catholics do it? Catholics come along this way, 36. Well, 38, we'll take the verse out. We'll just split half of verse 36. And make it verse 37, wrote 37 in the margin. <laughs> so they got 36, 37, and 38. You see the numbers right down there. 36, 37, 38. The verse is still gone. The numbers are there, but the verse is gone. They just made two verses out of verse 36. We looked at it this morning. Amen? You say, what's wrong? There's a famine in the land of hearing God's book. That one, not this one. Well, the King James is over here, so I can say this half of the page. <laughs> right over here. And here's another one. The Revised Standard Version. Gone. No verse in the Revised Standard Version. And they leave out the verse altogether. Verse 36. Skip down. Verse 30. Leave the verse plumb out. No footnote. No nothing. Nothing in the margin. No accumulation. Nothing. Absolutely nothing in the margin. There's a Revised Standard Version with no footnote, no nothing. The verse just gone, not anything in the margin, not nothing down at the bottom. Just took the verse completely out. You say, what happens? I can show you a hundred places where it happens. Uh, so it comes along, take your Bibles and turn to, uh, turn to, uh, John, the Gospel of John, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. For years, years ago, when the RSV come out, and the RSV showed up on the market in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, and beginning with verse 1, the RSV did not have it put in. The RSV didn't have it put in. So now they got real bold, and now they put it in, put it back in. So if you pick up an RSV nowadays, if you go up here to the bookstore and get an RSV, it has John chapter 8, 1 through 12 in it. But when the thing first come out, it was gone. It was taken out. Had a little note say, footnote, take out. Footnote out, gone, shouldn't be in. Later manuscripts have it in. Earlier manuscripts have it out. You did that. 
See, so what they do is guys like me start getting on to them. Start saying, hey, a bunch of Bible perverts. And you say, Bible perverts? Bible perverts! And I can give you chapter and verse. I give you a chapter. Yeah, I guess I will. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Take your Bible and turn. Turn over to Second Corinthians, and I'll I'll back up what I said when I say they are Bible perverts. They are Bible perverts. Take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter twenty-three and look at verse tw- uh, thirty-six. Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah and turn to Jeremiah chapter twenty-three and verse thirty-six. Now look at it, Jeremiah. And Jeremiah chapter uh, 23. And look at verse 36. Here's the Bible perverse. You say, Brother Bemis, you are hard on them. No, I'm not hard on them. God is hard on them. Uh, uh, I said, Jeremiah 23. And look at verse 36. And it says, in verse 36, How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of deceit. Okay, I was reading verse 26. Verse 36. And the burden of the Lord shall ye remain uh, mentioned no more. The burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more. For every man's word shall be his own burden. For ye have, now underline it in Jeremiah 23, 36. Ye have what? Perverted the words of the living God. Perverted. What if you do if you perverted something? You know how many of you ever heard of a sex pervert? You know what a sex pervert is? Amen, brother. Amen and amen. You know what those guys are? They're Bible perverts. You say, preacher. Yeah, Bible perverts. You say, what do the thing, the Lord think of that? I'll tell you what the Lord thinks of it. When a Christian saved, born again, soul winning man that professes good morals gets off and doesn't preach and believe that book, the Holy Spirit goes out the door and writes Ichabod across the door. Ichabod. You know what Ichabod is? Ichabod, the glory of God, is departed from Israel. And that's what God writes on a church when a man don't believe that book. And when a Christian doesn't believe that book. I said when the saved people don't believe it. There's a famine in the land. And I again, point number two. There's a famine in the land because of the devil himself. Because of the devil himself. You know what the devil does? The devil don't want a Christian to go. And the devil has a great hatred for a Christian getting in the word of God and growing by the book. You know what the devil knows? The devil knows if he can keep you out of the book, brother, he's got you. He's got you. So the devil has one purpose in mind in a Christian. You know some. Now listen to me. If the devil got you out of the book, he's satisfied with you. He's satisfied. He doesn't really care what you do. And he doesn't care what you do with your life if he can keep you out of the book. He's not interested in what you do if he can keep you out of the book. I'll tell you something else. He doesn't really care how much you get in the book as long as you don't do anything with it after you get it. Look at here. Man reads the Bible, reads the Bible, reads the Bible, studies the Bible, studies the Bible, studies the Bible. And then he never does anything with it. You think that upsets the devil any? Don't upset him a bit. He cares less. The question is, what are you going to do with the book after you learn it? How many of you have ever decided that you're going to read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? You can read from Genesis to Revelation in one year if you read five chapters a day. Five chapters a day. That's all you have to read. Five chapters a day. Just five chapters. If that's all you read. Per day, you know how long it take you to read the Bible? One year. One year. And you know some some Christians have been saved 10, 15, and 20 years. And they haven't read through the Bible yet. You know what's wrong? 
you ain't even reading a chapter a day. You're letting that book set and set and set and set and set. You know how hard it is to read the Bible? If you ever just sit down and say, now, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read the Bible from cover to cover. And I'm going to start reading this afternoon. And you sit down and you open your Bible up. And as soon as you open your Bible up and get ready to read, you hear a noise off in the room that sounds like a bomb going off. And a kid's yelling and hollering and screaming. There's a fight going on. And you put your Bible down. You go in to straighten out the fight. And you come back and read your Bible again. And as soon as you open up the Bible again, you know what happened? You hear something like a tink, 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 tink. You know what it is? It's the sink won't shut off and it won't close off. You can't get it shut off and it's leaking. You say, well, i got to fix that sink. And then you get up and you fix the sink and you go back to read your Bible and you sit down to read your Bible. Now you're going to read your Bible and you open up your Bible and your eyes go. You know what somebody told me the other day? He said, preacher, if I want to go to sleep and I want to go to sleep in a hurry, all I have to do is open up my Bible <laughs> and go to sleep just in the same. And you know what I do? You know what you better do? You better get to the place where you break that habit. Brother, if you got a habit of going to sleep when you open up the Bible, you better ask God to break that habit. You say, why? You never get through the Bible in a year. You never get through it. Why? You open up the Bible. You know what that is? That's the devil. That's the devil. You know, say, you say I'm demon possessed? No, man. I'm not saying you're demon possessed. I didn't say that. I'm just saying the devil's trying to keep, keep you from that book. It's hard. You make an obligation. One time I sat down, I said, Lord, I promise you I'm going to read that book through and I'm going to read it as fast as I can read it. You know what I did? I started in Genesis and I read from Genesis to Revelation in two months and two days. I mean, two months and two weeks. From Genesis to Revelation in two months and two weeks. You know what I was doing? I was reading four and five hours a day reading. I spent as much as five hours a day reading the Bible. Doing nothing but reading. How many of you ever done this? You sit down to read the Bible and say, Lord, I'm going to read a chapter today. And you start down, you read, and you get about four verses down there, and you get about five verses, and then all of a sudden, your mind is way off into a, 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 a way. And you're still reading down through there. And your mind's floating around in Hawaii and on the beaches of Hawaii. You're still reading on there. Oh, you went up on the Waikiki Beach and your mind is still reading down there. And you went out swimming on a big old wave and you come in on a big old wave and your mind's still reading down there. And you went in and you hit a big old rock and you, you're still reading down there. And pretty soon you, you stop and say, man, I was in Hawaii and I just read a whole chapter. Come on, come on. You say, I wasn't in a why, I was in a lack. Hey, you got the point. <laughs> you got the point. And some of you, well, you say, well, I wasn't there. How many of you read a whole chapter and you wasn't anywhere? Right. You just wasn't anywhere. Man, you wasn't in the chapter and you got through with the chapter. And I mean, right there and you finished the chapter and you said, what on earth did I just read? And your mind says, you didn't read nothing. And you say, well, I'll just keep on going. No, 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 man. Start and go back and come through again. And this time, pay attention in what you're reading. Right. You say, what's that? It's a devil trying to keep you out of that book. See, he does it to me, he does it to me, and he does it to you. There's a famine in America. You say, Christian people. I've met Christian people that I know they got a good heart, and I know they love the Lord, and I know they love spiritual things. But they don't love his book. You say, are they good Christians? Yes, they're good Christians. They just don't love God's book. There's a famine. There's a famine. There's a famine in the land because of the devil himself. He wants to keep you out of the book. He wants to keep you from hearing the book. There's a famine in America. How many preachers are getting up on a street corner and saying to those guys that go by the street corner that have never darkened the church for 20 years, and sticking their, their fist up in the air and saying, The Bible says! And then give them the word of God. You must be born again. Give them the book. Not many preachers, brother. Not many of them. You know an unsaved man think? And you and a lot of Christians think? A lot of Christians think that Christianity is for a church building. And not a street corner. You know what, by the grace of God, we're going to go out in the street corner this year. And we're going to set that speaker up again. And I'm going to get that microphone. And I'm going to say... 
It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this comes a judgment. And you say, what for? To get the word of God out and get it out and get it out and get it out. I'm surprised the devil hadn't stopped us. I'm surprised the devil hadn't stopped us. Why? He has a hatred for that book. And there's a famine in America today. Point number three. There is a famine because of the preachers themselves. The preachers themselves. The preachers get up in the, in the pulpit and they say the Bible says, and they don't believe the Bible says. They're not talking about the Bible. They're talking about something else. They're talking about something else. Now, Christians, look at me a minute. How many of you Christians have tried to memorize a verse of Scripture? Okay. How many of you found it was easy? Well, good. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you found it easy. You know, most of God's people find it very difficult and very hard. Memorizing a verse of Scripture. They open up a verse of Scripture and they memorize it. They say to me, preacher, I have just a hard time remembering it. You know, after you get in a certain age, maybe after you've passed a certain age, uh, I don't know, I haven't got there yet, uh, but <laughs> my wife's laughing. <laughs> Wait till you look at John and Joel and see how fast they can remember something. And then you take yourself, brother, the sign leading kind, you're going to have to be gracious with us, brother. You're going to have to pray for us, but it ain't going to be as easy as you make it sound. <laughs> it's going to be work. Once you pass a certain place, that old school don't come as easy anymore. It comes hard. It's work, brother, working for something, getting out there and working at it. But you know what a lot of it is? A lot of it is where your heart is at. A lot of it is the heart. See, we got a motive. See, Joyce is our motive. Joyce is our motive for learning sign language. Amen? That's a motive. That's the best motive we can think of. Amen? Somebody else. We got a heart in her. You love her, don't you? Don't you want to do something for her and help her and be a blessing to her? You know what I want to do? I want to be a blessing to that lady. I want to go over here and say, God, I was a blessing to her. I helped her out. I encouraged her. It's where your heart's at. If a Christian could get his heart in the book, maybe it wouldn't be so hard to learn it. I think of a man that could uh, give me uh, 20 deductions on his income tax. I mean, 20 deductions on his income tax, just like that, zip, 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 right off, off the top of his head. Hey, if you can do that with deductions on your income tax, how come you can't do it with the book? No hard head. No hard head. No hard head. Take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. I want to show you some preachers. I want to show you some preachers and what they've done with God's book. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, and look at verse 30. Jeremiah 23, 30. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that, underline this, steal my words. There it is. Steal my words. How can they steal God's book? They can steal that book and pervert it to teach something God didn't say. And steal God's book to do it. Say the Lord said. And then only quote half of what God said. Only quote half of it. You know what's wrong with people nowadays? They can only, only tell half the story. Only tell part of the story. And tell a complete first class lie. Just by saying half of it. Just by saying half of it. There's a famine in the land. Because of the preachers themselves. Take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. And this time I want you to look at verse 21. <coughs> Turn to Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 21. Here's a great verse for a Christian. You know, how I, you know how I got in the ministry? You know how I got in the ministry? I got in the ministry by taking a New Testament and putting my Bible. Sean, you want to get in the ministry? I'll tell you how to do it. Get your New Testament, put it in your pocket, and carry it with you every, everywhere you go. And every time you have a chance, take that book out of your Bible, take that little New Testament out of your pocket, and start reading it. That's how I got in the ministry. You want to get in it? That's how to get in it. Get your New Testament Bible, and every time when you're standing, when somebody else is drinking a cup of coffee and talking, you get your Bible and you open it up and you read it. And you read a verse and 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 read a verse. That's how I got in the ministry. I believe it with all my heart, mind, and soul. 
When a guy asked me a question, I'd ask, I'd witness to a guy, and a guy stumped me and I couldn't figure it out, I'd start praying and say, Lord, show me, show me the answer, show me the answer, show me the answer. And I got that little New Testament and I start reading it and reading it and reading it and reading it and reading it. You're so preacher, that's the hard way. That's the right way. It's the only way. Amen, brother. It's the only way. You say, how God do that? After you get that book and get in that book and absorbed in that book. Let me show you something. I know some of you have ever seen this or not. Why don't you look at my Bible? Look at the notes that I have in this Bible. Look at the notes I got in that Bible. You say you're bragging. No, I'm not bragging. I'm telling you how I got in the ministry. Look at the notes I put in that Bible. I got that from cover to cover, that Bible. I got so many notes in there, you can't even tell what, what notes go and where. You say from Genesis to Revelation. Genesis from Revelation going through. You say, what for, preacher? Because God has called me to preach and preach that book to you people. And you know what the preachers are doing? How many preachers you see that get in that book? You know what these preachers are doing? I've seen preachers' Bibles. I've seen them. And you say, well, they just bought a new one. Yeah, some of them do. But a whole bunch of preachers get up in the pulpit and they're giving what's off the top of their head and they're at living. Or they get something they get off the shelf and they go through there and they don't give you that book. Now turn to Jeremiah chapter 33 and I'll go back to without interrupting myself again. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 23. Now let's get it again. Jeremiah chapter 23 and look at verse 21. I have not sent these prophets, yet they run. They're running and they're screaming and hollering and yelling just like me. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesy. God didn't do it, yet they're doing it. But... If they had stood in my counsel, if they had done that, they had stood in God's counsel, and has caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil ways and from the evil of their doings. Underline that. My people to hear my words. You know why I preach that book to you? Why do I preach that book to you? What for? To turn you from your evil ways. You know what I expect? I expect that book to change you. I expect that book to make you different. You say, preacher, why do you name my sin? To make that book make you different. You say, it hurts. Yeah, it hurts. It hurts that old flesh. That flesh never did like to do anything spiritual. I've never met a man's body yet or a woman's body yet who likes to do spiritual things all the time. Now, once in a while, you may like it. Your face may like it once in a while. I can, you feel like shouting once in a while. I mean, that old flesh, you get just as happy as it can be sometimes serving God. But it ain't all the time. Not all the time, brother. There's times my flesh doesn't have, wouldn't want anything to do about it. Sometimes my flesh just do just the opposite. <laughs> And you say, what's that for? She ain't preached that book for you because there's a famine in the land. The preachers themselves have stopped preaching it. You know what I found? I found preachers get up in the pulpit and say, I believe the Holy Word of God. The Bible is the truth. You say, man, that's a Bible preacher. Man, he loves that book. We got a Bible preacher. Then when you get him down here, get him off over to the side over here like this, and you say, is there any mistakes in the King James Bible? And they say, yes, it's full of it. This word demon, this word devil shouldn't be in there. It shouldn't be devils. It should be demons. So let's change the word devils to demons. And they change the word devils to demons and take the word devil out of there. You say, devils, devils. You say, devils, devils. And in fact, the word demon does not even appear in your Bible that you have in your hand unless you haven't got a Bible. One year around here, we was preaching along. I have grace with the brother. I love him. I got grace, brother. I got grace. We won't run nobody off. Amen, brother? And Dennis Updegraff had a new, 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 new Schofield Bible. And I said, brother, the new Schofield Bible contradicts. It takes out and takes verses out where it doesn't tell you to take verses out. And I said, sure it does. He said, well, show me. I said, turn to Genesis. Chapter 3 and verse 15. 
I said they changed the word and changed the text and didn't tell you that they changed the text. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and between the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head. I said they've taken the word it out of the text and put nothing in the margin and took the word it and made it he and didn't even tell you that. And Dennis said, yeah, they sure did. The New Schofield Bible did that. Now I said, Dennis, if they do it once, they'll do it twice. You know what he did? He went home and started studying that thing, studying that thing, studying that thing, and he said, sure enough, preach it, they did it twice. They did it twice, they'll do it three times. And they do it three times, they'll do it four times. I'm waiting for a Christian to come by and say, preacher, they did it the third time, here it is. <laughs> You know something? Once you start down the road of changing, I'm talking about the King James authorized version. I'm not talking about any of the rest of them. Look at here. The open Bible. Sharon, do you still have an open Bible? You got it at home? Go home and look up in Acts chapter 7 verse 45. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 7 verse 45. Acts chapter 7 verse 45, the open Bible. Now you know what it says in the front of the open Bible? It says King James Version, authorized version, King James 1611, in the front of an open Bible. That's what it says. That's what it says. Amen? Amen, Sean? When she went down to the bookstore, she said, I want a King James Bible. I want a King James authorized version Bible. She went in there and said, that's what I want. They went over on the shelf and said, here's a good one. Here's an open Bible. Here's an open Bible, King James Bible. They, if you ask for King James Bible, they tell you that was King James Bible. You know what they've done? Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And in Acts chapter 7, which the uh, New International Version does, which the New American Standard Bible does, and what the uh, Living Bible does, and the Revised Standard Bible does, does the same thing. Acts chapter 7, verse 45. Acts chapter 7 verse 45. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Joshua. What does your Bible say? Why did they take Jesus Christ out of the verse? When every Greek manuscript ever written has Jesus in it. The amplified. The, uh, the Texas Receptus has Jesus. That's Jesus. The uh, uh, Vaticanus manuscript has Jesus. That's Jesus. The West Cotton Hort Greek manuscript has Ye Jesus. Jesus. Why on earth every Greek manuscript ever found has Jesus? Now tell me something. You're going by the Greek, are you? You can be proven. What I'm saying can be proven. You're going by the Greek. Why did you take it out of the book then if it's in the Greek? You know what it is? They use this thing right here. Oh, what a sign language for... <laughs> dumb. <laughs> dumb. <laughs> That's what it is. Dumb. They, they thought they were real smart, educated. I know Greek backwards and forwards. I knew Hebrew backwards and forwards. And I'm a scholar. And he used that brain up there and said it should be Joshua and not Jesus. And he took Jesus Christ out of the book. Don't mess with me, Jesus! And don't mess with my book. There's a famine. There's a famine. And it's getting worse. It's getting worse. Because of the... Uh, the devil, because of the Bible revisers, and because of the preachers, and point number four, because of the Christians themselves. Because of the Christians themselves. You say, how's that? They will not demand that the Bible be preached in their churches. They will not demand, now listen to me, they will not demand that the Bible be preached in their churches. That's why there's a famine in this land. They let the preachers get into the pulpit and not believe it and not preach it and they let them get away with it. And that's you folks. You say, preacher, we don't let you get away with it. Nope. 
What would you do if I left and some other guy come in here? You know what it is? It's like this. The liars. They're liars. When you sit them right down on the spot and you say, you believe the Bible? Oh, yes, preacher, I believe that book. I'm a Bible believer. And when you get them right down to the nitty gritty, they get up in the pulpit and they say, well, this, this trans, they don't do it in the pulpit. They'll do it down here in the teaching class and say, well, this is a mistranslation. How many of you had this preacher from down in the Bitterroot Valley that preached in my pulpit at the preacher's conference? How many of you were at that preacher's conference where the preacher got up and said, a better, better translation would be? Sharon heard him. He changed the book. He changed the book. Come across right out of the pulpit. And while he was changing the book, one of the other preachers said, Amen. While he was changing the book. And I thought to myself, uh, Boy, you ought to be glad I didn't have a whole bunch of people here. That have sure caught you for sure. And I said, I bet some of my people caught you. And when that guy got through, I thought to myself, I'll never invite you in my pulpit. You say the Bible Baptist Fellowship? The Bible Baptist Fellowship. You know what is this wrong? I'll tell you what is wrong, folks. The Christians in America nowadays are no longer demanding the fact that the preachers preach that book and believe in it. They're letting them get away with it. If I was sitting where you sat and some preacher changed the book on me, I'd say we want a preacher that believes that book or we don't want it. Let me tell you something. If God ever takes me away from here and takes me on down the road or takes me to heaven, you folks better have enough spiritual sense to demand that the man that gets you in this pulpit believe this book or burn this building. That's the way you feel about it. You say, I believe, feel out of way about it. If it goes up on a pile of smoke, I'll say that fellow didn't believe the book. <laughs> you say, you believe that preacher? This building don't mean nothing to me. What's it for? This building's for preaching that book, as far as I'm concerned. That's all it's for. That's all it's for, to preach that book. God's people don't demand it anymore. They're not insisting, we want that book. We want God's book. We want the preacher to preach the book. You say, preacher, you believe everything in it? I believe it, whether I can read it or not. I said that one time in a guy's pulpit. I said, I read through there. You know, now and then I destroy the English language. And, <laughs> amen, brother. And I read through there and I'll read a, wrong, a word wrong just coming and going. Amen. And it's just because I'm dumb and don't know how to spell it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> and don't know how to read the word. Amen. And it's not because I don't believe it. My wife said, Some, somebody's going to think you don't even have a King James Bible in the pulpit. <laughs> I got one. And I believe it. And that's ten times better than a fellow that can read every word in it who don't believe it. You say, preacher, what is it? God laid us out a plan. And God gave us a way. And if you want something straight from the horse's mouth, you get it out of God's book. And if you want it to be right, you get it out of God's book. And you messed up, you got a family problem, you got a big old heartache that's about to break your heart, and you don't know where to go and what to turn to, you get it from God's book! You don't have to come to me, or to some scholar, or to some preacher, you can get on your knees with your nose in the book and say, God, I'm in trouble. Give me what I need. But if it ain't in that book, where on earth are you going to go? You're going to go to me? I can't hardly read. You go to a scholar, he doesn't know whether he's coming in or going out. He don't know up from down. But if you go to God and go to his book, you can get everything you need. All of it. You can get all of it. What I'm doing, I'm just kind of reminding you on the road. But, brethren, there's a famine in the land. You know what we do in this church? You know what we put on? We ain't putting the emphasis on this building. We got a kind of a quantity hut here. You know what it is? It's a quantity hut. You look at that big million dollar plant they're building up here on the hill. Million dollar, nothing. Two million dollars if it cost a dime. And you say, what for? 
Wait till you get to the judgment. There's your judgment coming. You know something? If I had two million dollars, I wouldn't put it in the building. He said, what'd you do with it? I'd buy some Bibles and put a bunch of Bibles out. You'd say, you're crazy. Then I'd be crazy. I'd put a bunch of Bibles all over this town. I'd hire a bunch of men. And I'd say, I'd hire me about ten young men. And I'd put them on every street corner of this town, handing out gospel tracts and preaching with a microphone. You'd say, what for? Because we're going to the judgment. Because we believe the book. You know something? We put very little money in this building. Very little. Very little. Spend very little on it. You know why? Because we got ten over ten missionaries out on that board that's out there putting out the book. And when we think he's not putting out the book, we drop him. Amen. You drop him. You say, why? Because we think he's not putting out the book. You don't believe it. If you don't believe it, we're going to take him off the road. Take him off the road. Take him off the support. All right. Uh, you obey the Bible. It's a, uh, the book is not, be, there's a famine in the land because Christians not obeying the book. You know what you should guide your life by? Not money. Not money. Money won't guide your life. Money will lead you wrong 90% of the time. You know what you got to guide your life by? You got to say, Lord, I want to guide my life by what you got in that book and make my life go by what's in that book. And guide it that way. And guide it. There's a famine in the land. People are starving to death. Christians are starving to death all over this country. You know, Christians, if God ever moves for me and moves me from this church, you better have a prayer meeting for weeks and weeks and weeks before you ever call the next preacher because the Bible-believing preachers are far and far and few far between. And they lie like a Persian rug and tell you to believe it when they don't believe it. You better pull them over the coals about it. You better ask them more than four or five times. You better, you better say, prove it to me. Show it to me. Give me the verses before you ever get them in this pulpit because you, you're going to wreck you if you don't. All eyes closed and all heads bowed. There's a famine in the land because of the Bible revisers. There's a famine in the land because of the devil himself. There's a famine in the land because of the preachers. And there's a famine in the land because of the Christians. The Christians don't memorize the book. They don't put the book out themselves. I wonder how many Christians have memorized verses and verses and verses of Scripture. You say, Preacher, I believe in hell. Do you, could, you, could you give me five verses on hell tonight? If I ask you five verses on hell, can you give them to me? Can you turn to them, flip to them in a palm of your hand, five verses on hell? You believe... You believe in the blood of Christ. Can you give me five verses on the blood of Christ? You believe in heaven. Can you give me five verses on heaven? You believe in somebody getting saved. How many of you believe in salvation by the grace of Jesus Christ? How many believe that? Raise your hand. Amen? Amen. Can you give me ten verses on that? If I ask you tonight and stand up and quote me ten verses on, on salvation, could you do it? Now some of you can't do it. Some of you can't do it. You need to go home tonight and say, Lord, I'm wasting my time. I'm spending it somewhere I shouldn't. I'm spinning my wheels. Lord, help me to memorize your book and get back in and start memorizing it again. You're never too old. You're never too old to memorize God's book and hide it in your heart. You need to hide it. You need to memorize it. I had a man come to me one time and said, Preacher, I'm old now. He was over 65 years old. And that man come to me and said, I'm, I'm old, preacher, and I read the Bible every day, but I can't remember what I've read after I've read it. Is it doing me any good? I said, sure is. Read it every day. He said, but I, I forget what I read. And I, I understood what I read at the time, and I comprehended what I read, but I forget it the next day because I'm getting so old. One time this woman, she got it way up into her 80s, and all she could remember was the Bible. That's all she could remember. Finally, her mind started going. And all she could remember is one verse. The Lord. Got it down to two words in the middle of that verse. The Lord. The Lord. The Lord. The Lord. 
Christians, that's God's book. To pray about it, meditate in it, cry over it, weep over it, and start putting it out. Because there's a famine. There's a famine. And folks are hungry for God's book. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray tonight, by your grace and by your mercy, that your people would start keep on demanding that only a preacher that believes this book would be in the pulpit, Father. And your Christian would start memorizing the word, start meditating the word, and hiding the word in their heart, Father. Some of them gone days and days and haven't memorized much scripture, Father. Just one or two verses here and there, Father. And haven't done much with it, Father. Lord, I pray you'd speak to their hearts and speak to their minds, Father, and help them get in the book. Maybe there's a Christian here and say, Preacher, I haven't memorized much of it. I haven't memorized much of it. Would you pray for me and help me that I would memorize God's book? Would you raise your hand this evening? Amen. 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 Is that you this evening? Amen. Maybe there's a Christian here. Amen. Maybe there's a Christian here and say, Preacher, I've never read the Bible all the way through. And I've been saved several years now, but I haven't read it all the way through. The devil's got me sidetracked on other things so easily. And I want to read it through. And, and preacher, will you pray for me that God will give me the grace and God will give me the time to read his book all the way through. Will you raise your hand tonight? Will you raise your hand and say, that's me? Amen. 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 Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, every Christian that raised their hand, that would, would pray and help you to read the, help them to read the Bible all the way through, Father. Each one of them, Father. Every hand that was raised this evening, don't miss a one, Father. And Lord, help them to read the Bible all the way through, from cover to cover, Father. Even the hard parts, Lord, because you said man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Lord, help them to really live, Father. Give them the life that's in your book because they read it and get the blessing from it, Father. And Lord, these Christians here tonight that haven't memorized much of it, Lord, help them to memorize more verses of Scripture. And may they hide the Word of God in their heart that they might not sin against Thee, Father. In Jesus' precious name I pray, and for His sake. Amen. Let's all stand tonight. Take your, body, your hymnal and turn the page. Stands on the road for my life. The on the firm foundation for the Bible stand. Now, folks, you got the book. You got the book. Amen? You have it here, and it's yours.